Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our session. My name is Brianna Brown, and I'm the content manager at SafeGraph. And that basically means I'm a geographer and writer who gets to tell amazing stories with geospatial data. And I'm really excited to share some of those with you today at GeoIgnite. So today I'm joined by Juliana mcmillan Wilhoit from Tabulate Spatial, and we're going to talk about how POI data can be used for various community level analyses in Canada. So first we're going to talk about some of the ways that POIs can be used for geospatial analysis, and then I'll describe more about how POI data is created, what it is, kind of the nuts and bolts of it, and then Juliana is going to talk through some cool examples of ways she's used safe graph data. So first, I'm going to kick it off to Juliana for a minute to introduce herself and kick off our discussion around ways to use POI data. Hi, I'm Juliana McMillan Wilhite. I am a huge map nerd and I am a cartographer of change for both people and organizations. I am passionate about all things geo, and I run a consulting firm called Tabulae Spatial Services, where we provide um, services in geospatial consulting to large and small organizations, as well as training to help augment your, your workforce, such as training on how to use SafeGraph data and other data, as well as I do geospatial career consulting. I am um, really excited to be here to talk to you today. Uh, I'm an urban planner by training. I've worked uh, for a variety of different organizations, ranging from the U.S. federal government as an urban planner uh, to working for a consulting firm and working for myself. So I bring that uh, wide background um, in both ways and organizations that I've used SafeGraph in um, at, to, to this presentation today. And so all that I'm going to be doing is just talking about a few different examples of ways that I have leveraged uh, the amazing SafeGraph data to level up the analysis that I'm doing with the hopes that it may uh, inspire you and that you may get some ideas from this. Awesome. Thanks, Juliana. So essentially points of interest, um, they're called that points are of interest because of how they relate to other things spatially. So this pretty much boils down to Tobler's first law. Um, everything is related, but nearer things are more related than other things. And use cases for POI, POI data really all relate back to that, to understanding how something else relates to those points. And that relationship is what makes them of interest. So for example, POIs can show you the market landscape or how much market share a brand has. They can be used for proximity analysis with um, drive times, walk times, or other isochrones. POIs can be analyzed in relation to a population across space to see what types of amenities are accessible to certain people or um, certain groups of people. And POI data can be enriched with contextual information like foot traffic, property attributes, or demographic data to get a deeper understanding of what's happening at that specific place. And likewise, you can enrich other data with POI data to understand um, the commercial or leisure context within a town or a county, what have you. Um, and this last one is probably what most people interact with on a daily basis, whether you're a geospatial analyst or not. So find my nearest searches. POIs power base maps that consumers around the world use to figure out what's close to them. But what all of these use cases I just talked about, um, including this find my nearest search that's so pervasive in today's society, um, what it really boils down to is understanding the relationship between a POI and something else. It doesn't have to be commercial. It could be a school, a park, or landmark, or any place that someone spends time at, um, either for work or leisure, whatever. Um, that is a POI. So arguably almost every human geography analysis uses POIs in some way. Um, so those are some traditional ways of using POI data for community level analysis, but this past year has shown us just how important it is to have a solid understanding of where places are and how people interact with them. So at SafeGraph, we started a data consortium that provided this data to researchers for COVID response. And our data has been featured in over 300 academic papers related to COVID response. And a lot of the findings are similar to what you see here on the screen. So some industries like movie theaters and bars, for example, were hit particularly hard by COVID. Um, while others like supermarkets or just general merchandise stores saw actual spikes in foot traffic um, or visits to a specific place. Uh, when people were rushing to stock up on uh, some essential goods, like remember everyone rushing out to buy toilet paper those POIs had a huge increase in traffic um, at that time. 
So there's a lot of different ways you can use POI data to analyze market and community impacts of COVID, like identifying where to cut costs and close a store location or where to open a vaccination site. And a lot of governments and financial analysts are now using SafeGraph data to help rebuild the economy and develop models for recovery. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about SafeGraph POI data specifically and how we curate it so that it's the most accurate places data possible um, for all of these mission critical analyses. So at SafeGraph, we focus on being really, really good at one thing, and that's places data. So we currently offer over 8 million POIs um, across over 6,000 brands in the US and Canada. And we also just recently launched into the UK. So we offer four main products, which you see here from right to left. Um, we offer traditional POI data, which is called core places that has brand attribution, makes codes, contact information, and open close information with the lat long coordinates and the address. Um, then expanding upon that, we have our geometry product, which associates a building footprint to each of those POIs. So this can really help you understand things like spatial hierarchy, understanding um, what businesses are located adjacent to one another, are a couple businesses located in a strip mall that's all part of one polygon. Um, really understanding those relationships takes the, the geographic analysis a step further. And then using this geometry data, we also create our places patterns data set. Um, and patterns data um, uses the, the building footprint to um, attribute aggregated and anonymized mobile foot traffic counts to specific POIs. And you can also see which other POIs they visited, where they come from, and get a better understanding just, um, you know, different brand affiliations that people might have. And again, this is all anonymized and aggregated, so it's never down to the individual level, but you could understand that somebody did go to a specific POI from a certain census block group or dissemination area um, and then visited another POI in the same day or week. So um, the last data set on the right, neighborhood patterns, that is US only at the moment, but I'll touch on it briefly. Um, that is the same idea and methodology as places patterns, um, except it's just zoomed out a little bit. So rather than attributing anonymized foot traffic um, at the POI level, it looks at census block group to census block group. So you can really see between two um, more macro areas how populations move. Um, but for Canada specifically, we offer all three of the places data sets, so core, geometry, and patterns. And on safegraph.com, we have a few different examples of our Canadian data. These screenshots in particular show some analysis of the new Canada patterns data in Tableau. So Canada patterns just launched this month, um, and it again provides that aggregated anonymized um, foot traffic data for specific POIs. So here you can see, um, you know, the map on the left shows um, foot traffic to a pink berry in Toronto. Um, and then on the right, we have some um, branded visualizations. So showing the, the brands across Canada as a nation with the most foot traffic, as well as which brands get the most foot traffic um, by province. So um, like these screenshots, POI data could be used as the base of your analysis, or it could also be used to enrich other data you have or be combined with other data you have for a specific analysis. So this is particularly common with demographics or maybe political boundary data. Uh, it really just depends on your use case. And SafeGraph is a member, um, a founding member actually of the PlaceKey initiative. So PlaceKey is the universal standard identifier for a place and PlaceKeys are now available for Canada. So back in March, um, PlaceKey launched in Canada. So here you could see an example of two addresses for actually the same physical place in Toronto. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily know that they're the same place, or at least, um, you know, the computer wouldn't necessarily know that they're the same place because of how um, the name and the address are formatted differently. So it would be um, really hard and messy to join data to, um, you know, these locations and identify that they are the same actual place. Um, but using the place key API, you can then append a, you know, standard identifier place key for um, that place so that you can easily um, join other data sets to just that one place, not have duplicate records, and really just understand that that is indeed the same location so you can understand what's going on specifically there. 
Um, and, you know, at SafeGraph, we are just a data company. So our sole focus is curating physical places data and making it accessible to others, whether that be through um, delivery mechanisms or through appending place keys to all of our data to make it easier to join to other data. So I showed some visualizations earlier, but um, don't be fooled, we don't sell visualization tools, just rows and columns of data that can then help you make some really cool visualizations um, or run some really interesting analytics. Um, so because of that laser focus, we can provide places data for whatever your use case may be. Um, that is what we do day in and day out. And I touched on a few different use cases earlier, but really everything has a geography. So points of interest data can be applied across industries and use cases. You can see a few of them here that we've seen um, particular market traction in. Um, I would say in the past year, we've seen a lot of um, interest in the logistics side of things with so many people now ordering um, you, you know, things on Amazon or whatever their um, e-commerce site they're using, all those things are routed through a warehouse before then going to, um, to people. So we've been seeing a big interest in distribution centers and we've actually added that to our data set. Um, but then also for some of the more traditional POI um, use cases like site selection or site deselection, that has actually also been really ramped up in the past year because of COVID and just how that has exacerbated the need to either open new locations, maybe for healthcare or vaccination facility or close locations due to how the population has changed. Maybe people have moved out of cities um, and into suburban or rural areas, or maybe certain areas just have less foot traffic in general. So now Juliana is going to talk through some of her use cases for safe graph data. She is one of the most prolific um, geospatial influencers on various social channels. So I always enjoy seeing her maps and what she's able to do, particularly with safe graph data. And I know she's excited to share it with you. So as I've mentioned, I am from Chicago, Illinois, and we are a home to two different baseball teams. We have the Chicago Cubs, who are our north side team, and we have the Chicago White Sox, who are on the south side. I was really curious if we could understand, is there a line in Chicago where we can see where, where the Cubs and Sox fans come from? Um, can we better understand uh, their home locations? So I was able to use safe graph data to do this. So on the um, Left-hand side of the screen, the small map that that is shades of, of green, uh, I use the safe graph data. And so this is data from the months of May, June, and July of 2019. So um, there's no COVID taken into effect here. Um, and so what, what you're able to get with, um, with the safe graph data is you both can get point of entrance data in terms of the number of visitors that are um, for a particular location. But we also get the total number of devices um, from each census um, block group or the, the aggregation area, as well as right, how many people came from that area who went to a particular location. So what you're seeing in this map is what I'm calling the percent baseball fans. And so this is the um, percent for each of those areas that uh, went, that a device went to either uh, Wrigley Field or U.S. Cellular Field, the two different uh, baseball parks. So you can actually see here what what's really interesting is that uh, right in here, this area, that's that's downtown, that, that's the city of Chicago. And then it's actually a higher percentage in the inner ring suburbs of people who, uh, where there's um, a higher percentage of the devices that reside in those census track, uh, census block groups that went to a baseball game. So that, that just maybe helps give you a little bit of an idea about this data. But one of the other things that I was able to do is this map that you can see on the right. And so what we're looking at here is, again, at the census block group, which is the sort of low, low, lowest level of aggregation within the United States. And um, similar level will be available within the Canadian SafeGraph data. So what we can see here are, um, this is the ratio of the number of Cubs fans and Sox fans, so measured by the number of people, um, the number of devices that went to their respective ballparks. So the bigger the circle, the larger, you know, the, the ratio is uh, in regards to that team and, and that's the, the color that we're seeing. And so we can actually see a pretty clear line um, right about here, or sort of goes, goes like that, um, of 
you know, where those Cubs fans and Sox fans, where, what that dividing line is. I just thought that this was a really interesting way to be able to look at the data. And, you know, there would have been no way without SafeGraph data for me to, as just a interested and passionate uh, study uh, student of my city, for me to be able to to, to use this data and to be able to understand it like this. But as you think about applications, this is actually a really great example of how SafeGraph data can be used. Essentially, you can get an understanding of who their customers are and where they're going, right? If I had called up the Cubs or the Sox, they wouldn't have given me, you know, their customer base information, but I'm able to get a pretty accurate understanding of who their customers are. And you can do the same thing for your competitors. Um, I've done plenty of analysis in the past of who, um, of sort of the demographics of people who are going to competitor stores. You can get information on um, sort of same day shopping trips as well uh, within the SafeGraph data. So anyway, this is just one example of analysis that I did. Another way that I used SafeGraph data was in a coffee shop analysis. So this was for a small Chicago-based coffee chain, and we really wanted to understand what are factors that make a small independent coffee shop really successful, and how can we begin to replicate this model across the Chicagoland area. So we used a variety of different spatial data factors, ranging from demographic information to proximity to public transportation, um, uh, zoning, zoning data, location in the downtown, all sorts of different information. But one thing that was so important in this data set was where are coffee shops? And in particular, where are independent coffee shops and where are chain coffee shops? And I was able to use the SafeGraph point of entrance data to be able to pull that in easily into my analysis. And that was probably the easiest part of my data cleaning and the creation of my model. So that was uh, really important in terms of um, this spatial analysis for understanding where we think coffee shops should go. Another analysis that I've done is a synthetic routing or just a probabilistic routing. So with SafeGraph, um, for a point of entrance, so a store, um, a major tourist destination, you, you have that point of entrance and then you're able to get the home locations at an aggregated level for the, for the devices or the visitors who go there. That's pretty fantastic, um, as well as you get their work locations or their sort of their nighttime and their daytime. So, but what's really fascinating is we can begin to sort of do some um, analysis and some some sort of prob probabilistic things to to then understand how people maybe could get from their home to your location. So this is just an example of um, that I did where we have a. Uh, where we have people's home locations, those are the ends of this um, of, of this sort of spider chart um, with the location in the middle. And uh, what I'm saying here is these are the probable locations, so it's sort of the, the best route that, that they would have taken. Um, but, but what you can also see is, is it's sort of like all aggregating up so we can see sort of how many people probably or devices probably um, traveled along a particular roadway. Now, this is really helpful. So say you work in advertising and you're curious about understanding uh, about um, billboards. Um, if you run a, a few different locations and you want to understand, are people maybe going past my competitors to, to, get, to, my, to get to my location? Um, there's so many different things. Understanding how a tr um, traffic incident, um, upcoming road construction may impact um, the people who are coming to your location. Again, uh, this analysis, um, we're not using sort of a, mi a midpoint. So this is just saying like the best route, right? If you sort of like plug it into Google, Google Maps or, or Waze or whatever um, to get from point A to point B. But I think that sort of at a, at a whole level, this, this then becomes really, really useful. Another thing that, that we can do is just sort of look at a neighborhood level to understand um, where are people going uh, with, within a neighborhood. So these are two examples within the Toronto area. And so uh, on, on the right hand side of the screen, the orange dots, we are seeing there over the course of November 2020, 
uh, the number of devices that went to um, these different locations within that month. So the bigger the circle, the larger the number of devices. So that big, huge circle that you're seeing at the right-hand side, uh, that is actually a shopping mall that has um, a few different places that are that are inside of there. So that is why um, uh, that that has has so many visits. But this can be really useful if you are an urban planner, if you are a policymaker, um, right? There's plenty of different tools that we can use to understand traffic counts, um, transit data. But particularly right now in this environment where less people may um, be taking public transportation, it takes a long time to do traffic count studies. So this is a great way to be able to get, you know, maybe it's not an exact number of the people who have come to a particular location, but to understand an order of magnitude and that scale and understanding how are people's patterns shifting um, and how are people using the spaces. Now, the uh, spiky chart that you're seeing, uh, this is for the Wednesdays in November for a neighborhood in Toronto, um, the number of people who visited these particular locations. So again, it's just looking at the same data, but we're just looking at it in a slightly different way. Um, here we're looking at one day of the week. I mean, you can look at this for hour by hour. You can look at it um, day of the week. There's a lot of different aggregation um, opportunities that are that are provided in the data, um, right? But being able to understand at an incredibly low cost, how many visitors are going to your competitor, you know, even, or how many devices, just sort of a, in a rough order of magnitude of how many people are going there, that's pretty powerful um, analysis that, that's, that's pretty low cost. Or as an urban planner, being able to understand some of the fluctuations um, in people's travel patterns throughout the week, that again is, I think, pretty, pretty important. And uh, again, this data is available at a pretty, at an incredibly affordable cost, and it is so easy to work with. Doing both of these analysis and maps was incredibly, um, an incredibly quick process. So one of the other things that I absolutely love doing are making these fun maps. So with the point of entrance data, you are just able to just filter really quickly and make what I call fun maps. So I've made a map of places called love in the United States, uh, the uh, place a map of places that are called, that have spooky in their name. And uh, for Canada, I also made one of places that are called, that have maple in their name. And so I would welcome you to uh, follow me on social media. I'm at Juliana Mapper across all my social media channels. And I've actually posted a video uh, walking you through how, um, how I did that. Um, so I would be excited to, um, to get to walk you through that process um, of using that Canadian POI data to make a map of places named um, called Maple in, in Canada. So I would love uh, for you to, to follow along in my different mapping adventures. I post a lot of content um, related to how I'm using SafeGraph. I, um, you can follow me on all social media at Juliana Mapper. I'd also love to carry on the conversation about how we can leverage SafeGraph data for your organization and for your needs. Awesome. Thanks, Juliana. So we talked a lot about SafeGraph data today, but I wanted to share that there are a lot of different ways to, um, to get SafeGraph data. So actually back in March, we launched a beta version of our Places API. So you can check that out on shop.safegraph.com, or you can also go to shop.safegraph.com and purchase the normal way through um, just you know, adding stuff to your cart and downloading the file. We also have integrations with our partners like Esri, Carto, AWS, and Snowflake. So you can get data from those marketplaces or right in the products themselves in some cases. And of course, you can always reach out to us if you have any specific questions or would like someone to help you figure out what cut of data would be best for you. Um, we are here to help, so please reach out. Something really exciting though, specific to Canada, is that we currently offer essential columns for our Canadian core places data for free. So again, um, if you visit our shop, you'll see um, a tab there where you can download just some essential columns for our um, Canadian core places that traditional POI data uh, for free. 
So please go download it, um, show us what you create with it. We'd love to see it. If you, if you don't tag it on social, we'd love to share it. You could be featured on our data examples page. Um, and yeah, so, you know, thank you so much for joining our session. Check out our data, check out um, Juliana's social accounts. Again, she's a great follow. I definitely enjoy following her um, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Hello and welcome. Hi there. Hello. Hi, Brianna. Hi, Juliana. Thank you so much uh, for joining us at GeoIgnite. We're excited to have you and learn all about SafeGraph's POI data. That was very interesting. I myself uh, started my career as a GIS specialist. So that was very interesting for me um, to see all the things that uh, the kind of uses that you were doing with it. Um, I wanted to uh, start us off with a question. I see we've already got, uh, yeah, folks, please use the uh, Q&A tools for questions uh, for our speakers, but I'm going to take advantage and start us off. So um, I've kind of got a, a question about, so who are the biggest consumers of your POI data and what are most of them doing with it? Yeah, so we see a range of different industries using POI data, you know, like everything has a geography that's, as a geographer, that's one of my favorite things to say, but it's so true. Um, so really every industry can benefit from it, but we are seeing a lot of interest um, from retailers, particularly for things like site selection, market intelligence, um, just gathering consumer insights, that sort of thing. Um, but then also from analysts, whether that's um, financial analysts or a, a government analyst, geospatial analyst. So um, I would say, especially in the past year, given COVID, retail is a big one. The retail landscape has changed so much, but then also, um, you know, the, the public sector is really looking into it as well and academics just trying to better understand how communities have changed. Great, fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's go over to the Q&A and see what we've got. Uh, so we've got a question here on how do you get the locations of devices? Do they need to have their GPS enabled or do you get them another way? Yeah, so we source um, our data from a variety of sources. It really depends on the particular data set. I think this question is referring to our patterns data, um, which is again, that, that foot traffic mobility data. And so, yes, the way we get that is we license from um, different apps that people have opted in to share their location. So it's always um, from somebody that has agreed to share that location and then we license it from particular apps. Do you actually get an individual, it's all like anonymous by the yes. time it gets to you? Yeah. Correct. Because that would obviously be a concern. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We don't see anything related to um, particular individuals, just mainly volume and, you know, the volume where that volume is going. Right. Yeah. And this goes back to like uh, geoethics. Um, and that was kind of mentioned in the, um, the fireside chat that we saw and how important it is to use the power of geospatial uh, ethically. And it's good to see that you're doing that. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so this, is, this might really already be answered. It's does SafeGraph, uh, SafeGraph collect their own data or get it from third parties? And I, I think you explained that pretty clearly in the last one. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got one from uh, Philip. Uh, this is super interesting. Thank you very much. In regards to the POI data, how do you obtain the proper data in terms of databases if some companies cannot or do not wish to publish information on their competitors for confidentiality reasons? Yeah, so I'll touch a little bit on how some of the other data sets that I talked about are sourced. Um, you know, so mobility we covered, but we, we do offer other data just to core POIs and the geometry data. So um, that is a, it's a variety of us um, crawling different websites that have, so think about like your 
your favorite stores and you would maybe you go to a new city and you want to see if they have this store in that city and you would see like find my nearest uh, Starbucks, whatever it is. Um, all of those locations are publicly available online. So we just, we, we crawl those to actually get those put into our database for those core um, locations. So um, it's a combination of that and then also sourcing from, from other third party providers. Okay, and great. just to, to add on to that, as a super user of their data, what I think is so great is both that, um, right, that it doesn't require that opt-in from other businesses. So I've used this extensively in terms of doing competitor research to understand who is going to, um, to my competitors? Where are they coming from? Um, you can get some data uh, sort of in terms of like cross shop in terms of the same day or the same month. So that has been really useful for me. And so, yes, it's not necessarily a complete, right? We like the number of visitors that you're going to get is not going to be the same, right? The same number of people who actually come into the store, but it's really helpful for getting an order of magnitude and also just um, right, you're, you're, you're sort of backing into the problem in a new way. And so that's what I personally love about the data. Thank you. Well said. Okay, I'm going to close that one. Uh, going to Colleen's. Um, great presentations. Very interesting data and analysis. How do we get free Canada Core Places data? I've tried going on the website, but it requires filling out a form. I hate yes. Those forms, eh? Yes. Yeah, so um, apologies there. Um, this our shop has gotten a makeover since we recorded our our GeoIgnite session here. Um, so I'm speaking to you live, but that was a, a pre-recorded session if you couldn't tell. Um, and so. Um, we move really fast at SafeGraph, so sometimes our, our site gets updated, but we are going to email you after this session a direct link to your free download so that you will not have to fill out a form. Again, Great. apologies for the inconvenience, but it'll be in your inbox shortly. Fantastic. I'm going to close that one. Um, we've got another question. Hi. I was wondering when there will be a new release of the Canadian Patterns data set. Seems like the most release is the beta release. Yes. So um, the, the current version is beta, but it is launching um, like the, the full version May 6th. So very shortly. Um, so that will be out soon, but beta is currently out there now. Great. We... Um... Just checking. Okay. Yeah, we're into our break, but we got we have another question. So let's get to it. Uh, it's from Melody. Would we all get the link for the free Canadian data set? Yes. Yeah. Everybody that attended the session will be getting it. Great. Well, I want to thank you both very much, Brianna, Juliana. Uh, great presentation. Very interesting. Um, I look forward to seeing more uh, from SafeGraph in the future and uh, all the best. Thanks for having us.